Since my son Matthew died by suicide in 2013, I've learned so much about suicide awareness and prevention. Much of what I've learned is presented in this educational video by my friends at DYM. I'm so glad that you're willing to take the time to watch and learn. But let's be honest, you might be reluctant to watch this video because you're not a mental health professional, and it can actually be pretty scary to have a student tell you that they're thinking of killing themselves. When you're concerned that a student might be considering suicide, it can be so hard to know what to say, what not to say, and how to point students to the right help. The truth is, and I want to encourage you, is that you don't have to be a mental health professional to be able to help a student in a mental health crisis. The presence of a caring adult who knows and recognizes the signs and risks of suicide can help a student get the support that they need to make it safely through a crisis. I truly believe by watching this video, you will be equipped with tools that will save lives. You're gonna learn simple, practical information on how to come alongside and support your students who are struggling with suicidal thoughts and how to connect them with appropriate care. I am so grateful that you are taking the time to learn. Thank you for your care for students and for your ministry to God. Hi, my name is Josh Griffin. I've been in youth ministry for more than 20 years. I'm thrilled that you're watching this video on a critical topic, suicide prevention. My friend Craig and I are gonna share some practical ways to identify, prevent, and care for students who are dealing with this issue. Now, Craig's story isn't an easy one, but it undoubtedly represents many students in your ministry. So blessings as you care for the students that God has put in your ministry. My name is Craig Lomax. For almost 30 years, I've been dedicated to youth ministry as the director of a Christian adventure camp called Rock and Water. Our daughter, Melania Lomax, struggled with a mental illness. Soon after we understood she was ill, we lost her to suicide. I look back on that time and realize how unprepared she and the rest of her community were when it came to her onset of mental illness and her suicidality. Her parents, her friends, her roommates, resident RA um, at college, even, even the mental health clinician we took her to after catching her in a suicide attempt were all uninformed and ill-equipped to help her survive. None of us knew what to do. None of us picked up on the clues that she gave us weeks before when she might have been easier to help. But the good news is that suicide is preventable. And over the next few minutes, I want to provide you with some foundational knowledge and tools that might save the life of one of your students or staff. We'll talk about the prevalence of suicide, warning signs and risk factors for suicide, and steps you can take to help someone who is suicidal. This introductory training might be enough to help you save a life, but we're also hoping it will motivate you to seek out a more complete course. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year olds, and it's the, the third leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds in the United States. 8% of high school students try to kill themselves each year and more than 15% of them seriously consider it. Although most people who have a mental illness do not attempt suicide, about 90% of deaths by suicide have a mental illness component. The point is, more than likely, you have students in your ministry who are secretly suffering so much that they have either tried to escape the pain by attempting to kill themselves, or they're seriously thinking about it. The question isn't whether or not our youth are at risk. The question is, which ones? Recognizing the warning signs of suicide is the first step to preventing one. Here's what found it, the Foundation of Suicide Prevention says to look out for. Moods you might describe as depression, anxiety, loss of interest, irritability, humiliation, agitation, rage, or someone talking about killing themselves, feeling hopeless, having no reason to live, being a burden to others, feeling trapped, or about unbearable or unexplained pain, and behaviors that may signal risk, especially if they're related to sudden loss, change, or painful event, are increased use of alcohol or drugs, looking for a way to end their lives, such as searching online, 
withdrawing from activities, isolating themselves from family and friends, sleeping too much or too little, visiting or calling people to say goodbye, giving away prized possessions, aggression, or just fatigue. Unfortunately, even the most clear warning signs are often disregarded because unless you have been taught otherwise, most of us can't imagine someone we know actually wanting to die. Be aware of even subtle statements like, I'm so tired, I, I just can't take it anymore. Or people, people will be better off without me. Or I don't know if I'll be around. Although we, we want to respond when we see anyone exhibiting warning signs of suicide, some students are more likely to be suicidal. Here are some risk factors to be aware of. Students who are perfectionists or who have learning disabilities or are LGBT and fear family rejection or who are loners with low self-esteem. Also keep an eye on students who are under pressure to succeed and, and have a single source of identity that is being threatened. The, the ones that have been abused, molested, or neglected. Or lost a significant relationship or loved one, especially to suicide. If they've been bullied or humiliated, and students in serious trouble. And be on alert if you notice anyone for two weeks or more exhibiting a negative change in behavior or uh, having unexplained physical pain, because they might be at risk too. You should keep in mind that suicides never have a single causality, but they happen because of a combination of biological, psychological, social, and cultural factors. All right, now that we've talked about the prevalence of suicide, and I, I think you've got a chance to recognize some of the warning signs. Now let's talk about where it really matters, how you can help to prevent suicides. You may not realize it, but just by being part of a healthy youth ministry alone, you're preventing suicides. You're making a big difference. We now know that when a student feels closely connected to others, when they have a sense of belonging to that larger community, they feel like their contributions to it are meaningful and they're making a difference, they're part of that community, just those aspects of their lives can be a great buffer against that decision to commit suicide. Now, my hope for you is that you can easily widen that buffer by talking to your students about suicide, about mental health, especially depression. Maybe there's some mental health screening tools that you can look in some of our downloads and have your students consider using them to empower them to help themselves and help others because early intervention is the best prevention. Another successful tool you could incorporate in your ministry is the development of a peer counseling program, which enables teenagers and young adults to gain and use communication skills so that they can minister to each other as well. So what do you do if you find yourself wondering if a student or staff person might be suicidal? The answer is surprisingly simple. You ask them about it. You can work up to the question slowly, or you can ask it abruptly. The important thing is that you ask, and that you ask clearly and directly. It might sound something like, are you thinking about killing yourself? Or, do you want to die? Ask in a way that communicates that you care, and that you're ready and strong enough to handle even a yes answer. Avoid leading them into the answer you want by asking something like, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? But whatever you do, don't be afraid to ask. You might be concerned that the question will give them the idea of suicide, but multiple studies have shown that asking doesn't plant the idea in a person's mind. Their brain either has suicidal ideations or it doesn't. The biggest mistake you can make is not asking or not getting someone else to ask when someone might need help. It's not an easy question to ask the first time, especially when you care deeply about the person you're asking. So let's practice. I want you to say out loud, are you thinking about suicide? With me on three, ready? One, two, three. Are you thinking about suicide? Okay, good job, I think. <laughs> what might help you ask the question is knowing that 
if they are suicidal, they will almost always be relieved you cared enough to ask. And more significantly, that their secret is out. Deep down inside, those who struggle with suicidal ideation want to ask for help, but because of the stigmas surrounding mental illness and suicidal ideation, they can be afraid to do so. Simply asking the question can be like freeing them from a terrifying imprisonment they saw no way to escape. Once someone tells you they are having suicidal thoughts, you want to do your best to coach them toward help and safety. In order to effectively get help, they have to want it. Every situation is different, but the underlying motivation for wanting help is hope. And the good news is that there is tremendous hope for the majority of those who are suicidal, as most get help, the help they need and recover and are able to live fulfilling lives. Even the deepest pain can heal, and mental illness, especially depression, is treatable. Keep in mind that if you are talking to a person who is suicidal, you're talking to someone who, at least in part, still wants to live. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. So listen to all of what they have to share, taking note of any reasons, even the smallest, they have for living, so you can draw out that part of them that wants to stay alive. And realize that just listening can be powerfully helpful. A suicide lifeline consultant once told me that by asking questions and listening, most callers will talk themselves into wanting help. So listen to them. You may want to remind them of how much the Lord loves them and wants to work through them in this world to do good. But if they seem unable or unwilling to relate to such encouragements, this is probably not the time to push spiritual or biblical truths. Be patient. You may find them much more receptive to your spiritual guidance after you help them through this life-threatening crisis. And it's important to remember that you are not on your own. So help students realize you're not alone going through this. I know it feels that way, but you're not alone. So coach the student to be calm and try to collaborate with them and, and get help. Bring others into the conversation. Assure them that you'll work with them to make certain that they have the help and support they need. Now, ideally, you would have a list of local resources that you can turn to get them the help they need, but maybe you don't have that and you could create this for your group or someone, you know, encourage someone to take the lead at your next gathering. And if you have trouble talking students into getting help beyond listening and beyond your conversations, even just knowing what resources are available could help them a ton. Maybe you'd call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. What an, a great opportunity that is to have someone listen to them and care for them. A great resource outside of your ministry as well. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to find a mental health professional on short notice. And because this is a very serious situation, always be ready to call 911 if someone is in imminent danger. If they're going to hurt themselves or someone else, and maybe you can't even leave them alone because it's unsafe to be, I get it. But not everyone who attempts or dies by suicide has a pre-established plan. But everyone who's seriously thinking about it, they should be considered in grave danger. And especially those that have a plan, they are at a clear risk and they need to be kept away from any means of killing themselves especially the method that they have been thinking about. So have 911 on the back of your mind at all times. And when calling 911, if there is an emergency and we need you to do that, ask for someone with special training on the line. Ask for someone from the Crisis Intervention Team or CIT. And knowing those three words will give you a different person on the line who could really, really help. And no matter the situation or what help you try to provide, don't try to provide it alone. The person at risk needs a team, not a hero. That's why you should always take care to not make promises of confidentiality when it comes to life-sustaining information and why you should break such a promise and when appropriate, even if it's going to make them upset with you. The kid's life and their future is all that matters in that moment, not a promise to keep a secret. They need and want to be heard and found out. In situations where calling 911 maybe isn't necessary, 
and the person you have some concerns about is uninterested in help, at least give them the number to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and even, even give them the text number so that they can talk to somebody over text. It's a great first step and help them find some help. The phone number is 1-800-273-TALK or they can use the text number which is 741-741. Man, it'd be great if you'd even put that into your phone or take a picture of the screen right now so that you always had that available to send or encourage other students if they're in a life-threatening situation. And encourage teenagers to call it whenever they feel like killing themselves. If you can, maybe text it to them. Maybe you'd even pause the video right here and send them that note right now. There's also some great resources where if someone won't see a professional, you can go through an app or a website and encourage them to build a safety network and establish a safety plan. Now, whether they get professional help or not, make sure that you follow up to be sure that they're getting the actual support they need and that they have a safety plan in place so that they and hopefully their parents can be embraced and loved fully through this difficult time. They'll need to have adults involved who care about them, parents, relatives, maybe protective services if their home is in an unsafe environment. You know, surround them with a bunch of people who love them. So hopefully you know a little bit more now about what to look for and how to respond to someone who is struggling with suicidal ideation. My hope is that you seek out more complete training for your entire youth ministry. There's other courses that we have listed and I would encourage you to consider getting trained and helping others be trained to be aware and responsive to those who might be at risk for suicide. Mental Health First Aid is one of the leading training programs in the country. It's typically offered free, and there's a course for adults that focuses specifically on youth and suicide intervention training. There's a couple other resources that are pretty extensive. If this is your heartbeat and you want to go further, you could check out the QPR Institute's Gatekeeper course or the Assist class by Living Works. You know, this isn't just about saving lives. It's also about doing what I believe Jesus wants us to do in youth ministry, being there for a student in need who's going through some of the most difficult times of their life, and they may be suffering terribly in secret. And if everyone is trained to see the signs of suicidal ideation and cares enough and knows to intervene, everyone will know that they can turn to each other for help without the fear of being judged or dismissed. I want you to create a safe youth ministry for those students to share how they feel inside. So let me say this, thank you so much for listening and for caring for teenagers. Blessings to you as you continue Jesus's work.